and he uh, did his PhD in Krakow and is now a postdoc at Stanford University with Roger Bamford. And uh, Lukas will tell us about physics and observations of external reactive jets. I just mentioned that um, Lukas is visiting the Nordita program, which is on uh, um, jet physics, which is going now on until the middle of, of June. So please. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to give the talk. Um, as uh, instead of the outline of the talk, um, I would just like to point out, uh, uh, roughly say, uh, what are extragalactic jets and why they are so difficult to understand. So this is the radio image of one radio galaxy when um, using different radio instruments we can see a structure spinning from hundreds of kiloparsec scales up to as far as we can go, so subparsec scales. In case of the uh, more, most nearby objects like the radio galaxy of 87 with VLBI, uh, we can go up to 140 radii from the black hole. And we see the jets. The jets namely um, well collimated streams of plasma emitting synchrotron radio emission. So first thing is that you see the enormous range of scales spun by these objects. And these are in fact the largest coherent structures in, in the universe. The, larger, the largest radio galaxy we know is like about four megaparsecs, so it's much bigger than even the clusters. So these are the biggest objects uh, in the universe. They are the most powerful objects in the universe, so therefore very interesting. And of course they are very difficult to understand at least because of this um, uh, range of scales. So there is at the moment, we cannot simulate those objects by means of one end-to-end -end like, uh, end -end like numerical simulations. So if we want to probe the larger scales of the order of, let's say, the jet radius of 10 to 21, 10 to 24 uh, uh, um, centimeters, we can use the um, hydrodynamical simulations, hydrodynamical codes. But because of the limited dynamical range, they cannot probe much uh, smaller scales than, let's say, few orders of magnitude below this. So by means of um, magnetohydrodynamical simulation or hydro simulation, we can basically probe only the, the big structures of these objects. Then we, when we go to the, when we want to address the, the um, issues like particle acceleration, energy dissipation processes, and so this is synchrotron emission, so we basically see only ultra activistic particles. We don't see any thermal emission from this jet. That's another difficulty. So everything we observe is just non-thermal emission. So the scales appropriate for the ultra atavistic particles in, pri in principle electrons emitting synchrotron and then inverse Compton emission is let's say of the order of the um, gel radius of the particles so it's like much much less than the scale of the system 10 to 16 centimeters and this uh, uh, for, for a given magnetic field let's say like this and the Lorentz factor of the electrons 10 to 8 so 100 TV electrons and these processes can be probed so right now only by means of Monte Carlo simulations. And then we, when we want to even address the, um, uh, the physics on much smaller scales, so like on this case of the plasma, uh, uh, corresponding to the plasma frequency, so the, the, the basically the smallest scales in a, in a jet plasma, we can use particle insert simulations. And these are, for example, the authors that are doing this kind of research. So there is a lot of people doing MHD, um, some Monte Carlo, regarding shock uh, shock, uh, particle associated shocks and then the uh, general structure of the, of the um, collisionless plasma by means of particle simulation by number of groups, um, also Spitkowski who will be um, also here in the Nordita. And uh, again, because of the uh, numerical uh, strong limitations, we cannot really um, uh, run these simulations uh, for a long time, so we see only a bit of the um, uh, of the plasma, um, very limited scales, and so there is no one simulation that we could address the whole issue. So we we have to use all of these constraints plus observa observations to to understand what is going on. And um, uh, the first thing to say is that the, the primary role of the magnetic field um, uh, in jet is to assure a fluid-like character of the jet plasma. So um, the extragalactic jets and most, like most of the plasma in astrophysics, this is a collisionless fluid, namely the particle um, collisions, like uh, uh, Coulomb collisions, are very, very large. So for example, one can estimate the mean free path for the Coulomb collisions and the, um, compare it with the um, um, gyro radius of, of thermal electrons, for example, and the device screening length of the plasma and what we see is that the um, 
um, mean field bus for the Coulomb collision is much, much, much larger always than the scale of the system. So therefore, the jets are uh, the, the plasma is collisionless, we say. But then the scale of the system is much, much larger than the device screen, uh, screening length or the uh, gel radius of the particle. In other words, this is magnetic field that assures a fluid-like character of the jets. Therefore, we can use, for example, a fluid-like description for for the jets. And now. Uh, uh, just to introduce the, the, uh, some um, uh, parameters that uh, later uh, I um, will appear uh, during the talk. So, for example, as I said, we can treat the jets as the um, uh, magnetized fluids. So, in some cases, the uh, MHD uh, approximation holds, but only in some cases. So, for example, as I said, when we go to really low, uh, the smallest case, um, MHD approximation, of course, doesn't hold anymore. And the idea of MHD, this is the set of standard uh, MHD equations, non-relativistic equations, so with the electric field, like displacement and related displacement currents, etc., neglected. Uh, we see that uh, for uh, negligible resistivity, which seems to be the case in, in most of the astrophysical plasma, so in other words, for high magnetic Reynolds number, Reynolds number of the plasma, we can really neglect magnetic field. Uh, uh, the uh, electric field in the plasma restraint vanishes. So this is the uh, this is the just the um, um, continuity equation for the matter. Rho is the density of the matter. Tau is velocity of the plasma. Uh, this is a pressure, thermal pressure of the matter, and magnetic field. So uh, magnetic field. This is induction equation for the magnetic field. In this approximation, magnetic field is advected with the plasma. So the magnetic uh, flux is conserved. And um, in strictly with, with negligible resistivity, the uh, diffusion of the magnetic from the system is, uh, is taking place on very, very long times, so we can neglect this effect. And um, on the other hand, magnetic field affected with the plasma expect due to the Lorentz force. And this is this Lorentz force, which contains the term uh, a pressure uh, due to, uh, correlated with the pressure of the magnetic field. So if we have a pressure of the magnetic field, there is a force. And also, if we have a curvature of the magnetic field, the tension of this curved magnetic field uh, uh, gives rise to the uh, Lorentz force, which acts back dynamically on the plasma. Sometimes, uh, if this is a question, uh, there is um, a very interesting uh, uh, regime uh, for the uh, MA, uh, for MHD called force-free. And the force-free approximate uh, um, regime is when the um, energy density in magnetic field is much larger than the kinetic uh, than the energy density <coughs> bulk. Uh, energy of the, uh, of the plasma. It's so-called sigma parameter very often, which is basically the ratio of alpha and velocity to the uh, velocity of the, uh, of the jet. And if the magnetic uh, uh, pressure is much larger than the thermal pressure of the, um, uh, of the particles in a jet. So if, the, if, if this is much larger than unity and if this parameter is much smaller than unity, then magnetic field is basically with equilibrium with itself. So the magnetic uh, um, in this term, that I said that there are two uh, th uh, terms, magnetic field pressure balance the ten uh, tension forces, currents, and the system um, uh, carries current, and the currents are flowing uh, parallel to the field lines. So this is um, probably very basic, um, uh, so just for the introduction. So um, starting from the, the smallest scales, if we... So what is the central engine? This is unresolved, so as I said, by means of uh, with radio interferometers, we can probe the smallest and smallest case up to a few hundred short radii, and we already see a form outflow. So, what is the central engine here in the center of the galaxy? And uh, since all the jets are launched from the very centers of, of galaxies, mostly elliptical galaxies, we know they are supermassive black holes, and we have a very strong evidence for black holes, and we can measure the masses. And of course, the well-known example in our galactic center, there is a dynamical evidences for the black hole of uh, 10 to 6 solar masses. Um, in a center of elliptical galaxies, the, the measured black hole masses are between 10 to 8 and 10 to even up to 10 to 10 solar masses. And we believe that this is the black hole um, with accretion disk, which is the, the, the engine, uh, that this is the black hole which launched the jet. So just again to, 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 to give some um, uh, numbers, um, uh, what, what scales and what, what uh, luminosities we are talking about. So if we consider a supermassive black hole with a 10 to 8 solar masses, the gravitational radius is of this order. 
And it's well known that if the black hole is spinning rapidly, in addition to the, uh, to the uh, event horizon, we have also another critical surface, uh, which is a static limit. And in between of this, there is so-called ergosphere. Within the ergosphere, um, there is no static observer. Every, um, everything in the ergosphere has to rotate in the same sense as a black hole. We also know that the black holes um, cannot have uh, um, its own magnetic field. Uh, so it's, it's just described by the, uh, uh, by the mass and the angular momentum. Uh, however, black hole can be merged into an external magnetic field. And this external <coughs> magnetic field has to be supported by the external currents. For example, within the accretion disk. So, um, because of this, we can estimate, we don't know, for example, what is the uh, intensity of the magnetic field or structure here, but we can estimate something like the maximum uh, uh, intensity of the magnetic field, which would be equal to the, uh, that, uh, the, the, that would correspond to the case when the magnetic pressure is equal to the pressure of the accreting matter. And this is of this order. So this is the estimate for the, just close to the, to the event horizon. And the Eddington luminosity for this mass is of this order. So, uh, how much, how to extract this power and how much power is available? So, um, there was a number of research on this issue and um, what, uh, what is the, the basic idea for extraction energy from the spinning black hole is that um, if we have uh, external magnetic field and the black spinning black hole is amended uh, in this uh, external magnetic field, then it acts like a unipolar inductor, basically. And um, if we can make the currents flowing, for example, let's say that uh, force-free approximation that I introduced before holds in the vicinity, vicinity of the black hole, namely that the <coughs> magnetic field pressure and energy density exceed the pressure and energy density of the plasma, inertia of the plasma, the, the currents flow along the magnetic field lines, and if we allow the currents really flowing, this is, let's say, spinning black hole, and this is the magnetic field lines, if we allow currents to flow along the magnetic field lines and close somewhere far away where the force-free approximation already breaks, so the currents can flow not only uh, along the magnetic field lines, then in principle we can extract the energy. And very roughly from the uh, standard um, uh, equation, Maxwell equation, we can estimate the potential drop which is of this order, and this is the, um, uh, it depends on the ratio of the black hole spin, um, um, uh, dimensionless divided by the maximum one. And so, for example, the energy that would be extracted for the, for a charge of the, um, uh, 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 for the charge equal like electron charge is of this order. This is very interesting because this is of the order of the, for the rapidly spinning black hole, so if this parameter is equal one, is roughly the, the energy of ultra energy cosmic rays detected by the pure, not only by pure correlation, but uh, uh, also by the previous experiments, but this is like the, the highest energy of cosmic rays detected. So there is also a lot of discussion if this ultra energy cosmic rays can be accelerated in the vicinity of the black hole. And what the power? Again, the power can be under some, uh, of course, uh, assumptions after many, many calculations can be estimated of this order that depends on the black hole mass and this dimensional spin parameter uh, to the power of two. So we can say, uh, what we can see is that uh, if jets, uh, jet power is extracted from the rotational energy of the black hole, then we should expect the total kinetic energy of the jet in this range. And the jets produced only by uh, rapidly spinning black holes. So how, in principle, to extract this power was proposed by Van Brandt in 1977. Uh, so they discussed the, um, um, uh, the, uh, the scenario for extracting this power, which is, um, 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 which is basically so, uh, saying that if we have a magnetic field, maybe up here, if we have external magnetic field with the poloidal largely structure outside of the magnetic field, which is uh, dragged with the accreting matter toward the black hole and enters the static limit, then within the ergosphere is twisted in the, uh, along the equatorial plane of the rotating black hole. And, um, and since uh, in, uh, in the ergosphere every, uh, every, there is no static observer, there, there is electric field everywhere, the plasma is unstable for the pair production. The pairs are accelerated 
along the thin lines with the uh, 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 due to electric field and emit gamma rays. Gamma rays annihilate creating uh, electron positron pairs so cascade develop and in this way we add the plasma. So we start from the configuration just rotating black hole and magnetic field and then uh, 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 the expectation is that within the ergosphere we spontaneously create the, the plasma with the negligible inertia of the matter so with the force field configuration and uh, such a uh, magnetosphere can basically uh, carry a cu currents and allowing us to close the circuit and extract the power from the black hole. So um, I was uh, um, talking more about this issue one week ago, so <laughs> I, uh, I uh, don't have time uh, during this talk to go to the details, but what I want to point out that this scenario that existed in 77 that was the um, um, analytical calculations, um, some approximation perturbative solution for, in fact found for the uh, slowly spinning black hole can be tested right now by the numerical simulations and these simulations are carried uh, by uh, several groups, for example this group uh, is doing 3D uh, non-conservative general relativistic ideal MHG simulations of a rapidly rotating black hole so the setup of this simulation is that they have a black hole and they add the torus, which is initially supported by the uh, uh, pressure and uh, rotationally supported. And they add to the unmagnetized torus uh, small loops of colloidal magnetic field. And then they start simulation. So what they see is that uh, within the torus, due to uh, MRI instabilities, uh, magnetic field is quickly amplified, creating a colloidal structure within the, uh, uh, within the accretion disk. Uh, within the torus, the accretion starts, magnetic field is dragged toward the black hole, and the whole process starts. And basically, it works uh, very similarly to how it was described uh, in Blood Friends Diet. So, in a disk, as I said, the disk is matter dominated, so this uh, beta parameter is much, much less than one. Uh, um, uh, because of the MRI instabilities, uh, um, as I said, accretion starts, corona uh, above the disk is established with roughly the pressure equilibrium between the magnetic field and the matter, and the outflow. Uh, starts to be launched. And the outflow, what they observe in the simulation, is two dimensional, uh, consisting of the pointing flux dominated jet, strongly dominated by the magnetic field, and so called uh, funeral wall structure <coughs> at the edges of the jet. And the other simulation with slightly different codes, so ideal MHD simulation, slightly different coordinates, and um, gave the same results. So this is the beginning of the simulation. We have a torus. And then after some times, we see that the torus starts to be turbulent because of the MRIs. There is magnetic field, coronal established, and we have an outflow. And this is the magnetic field lines. At the beginning, small colloidal loops added, and then very turbulent this structure, and the colloidal field, uh, and there is a jet. And uh, there is an outflow here. But essentially, this large scale colloidal field that you find later spreading the hole is essentially this loops that open. So from accretion, some matter is driven outside? Uh, you mean uh, uh, so how you the tunnel walls? The how you element? form this large scale magnetic fields that thread the uh, ah, uh, uh, so, you know, uh, so what you what you do is that uh, because of the MRI you have a magnetic field, a colloidal magnetic field all of the scale of the torus at the beginning and then within the, um, as I said, within the ergosphere it's, uh, um, it's twisted uh, uh, in equatorial plane there is, uh, uh, and because of the reconnection um, because of the reconnection, the so-called split magnet of uh, uh, split uh, monopole configuration established. Uh, so, because some uh, matter with the uh, with the uh, with this magnetic field, colloidal magnetic field, enters the given horizon, so you end up with the magnetic field um, having something like monopole configuration of the magnetic field. So and this is this, not, this is this field. So, do you think it's not like you, from your initial configuration, some material that flows outside uh, your uh, the simulating box carries some colloidal flux and this magnetic field actually opens um, no 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 so this is this this field is, is on a la much larger scale that that what is created within the disk so it's not that you create that you assume magnetic field uh, colloidal like of this scale no but if you open magnetic field lines from your initial configuration essentially yes. if some material leaves your box and they open, they would appear just in the... Uh, in some sense, how... The box of the... Like, the how I, I guess that would be like the setup for the numerical simulations, right? What is the box, etc. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
I guess those people avoid it. They like artificially creating magnetic field, for the structure of the magnetic field. I'm not doing the simulation, I'm just referring to work. So, yeah. And, uh, no. So the other, uh, so this is one possibility for extracting energy from the rotating black holes. Of the, uh, and the, the, the total energy extracted in this way, I have this. Uh, like so, we, we extract energy from the rotating black hole. We we'll reduce the um, um, uh, so-called reducible mass of the black hole, and this is of this order. For the um, uh, uh, of course, the, 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 the rest mass of the black hole is is increasing because there is always a question. And uh, interestingly, this number is somehow consistent with the ones needed when we observe a cluster of galaxies with the jets uh, from cavities in clusters. This is the, uh, just, just the work to, this, uh, to, to push out the ambient medium within the center of the clusters is of this order. So if black holes, um, uh, so if the black holes night uh, process is the case, then basically all the ener rotation, rotational energy of the black hole has to be extracted uh, in forms of the jet and then deposited into external medium. How but is that then the partition between the spine and the sheet? Excuse me? How is this outgoing energy partition divided ah. up between the spine and the sheet? Yeah. So, uh, in fact, uh, you cannot find this in, in the papers. <laughs> because they, um, 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 firstly, they are limited because they last for only some time, right? The setup of the simulation is very artificial because they start from the torus, right? You never had like this. Uh, uh, so um, the numbers, uh, for example, about the you know the, the particular value of the beta parameter or the energy of like if the more energy is here than in here, is dependent really on the initial conditions. And uh, so therefore, I believe that the the, on, the only robust conclusion from this is that uh, like blunt Rosnaik assumed large-scale colloidal magnetic fields. Uh, to extract this energy, but they pointed out that you don't have to do this because the enough magnetic field will be, it seems to be self-consistently uh, uh, created in a disk. So that's the results of this calculation. But even if we don't start from the last field magnetic field, we'll end up with the configuration that was considered by blunt and Snipe. But this is not, of course, the only way of, uh, of launching the jet. And there is the other uh, process discussed, also proposed for um, um, some astrophysical sources much before, but in case of AGNs, discussed firstly by Blanford and Payne in 82, namely the, um, the disk outflow. So if we have a spinning black hole, spinning or not, but an accretion disk, and we have magnetic field within the disk with the magnetic field lines open, even if within the disk, matter inertia, the inertia of the matter dominates, above the disk, in the disk corona, uh, uh, the, the magnetic uh, dominates over the inertia of the plasma. So if we have magnetic field, um, let's say, um, starting from the disk and then extending in the disk corona and the disk is rotating, then we have a rotating colloidal magnetic field lines and due to the centrifugal forces, uh, the, uh, the matter can be extracted from the, from the jet and accelerated along the field lines. And this is a very general um, uh, idea and that was discussed by, by um, by several people, so that's also is also kind of complicated uh, um, analytically. So it's also studied by means of numerical simulations. What I just wanted to point out <laughs> is that um, in this case we uh, uh, expect slightly different jets than resulting from the blend force night process. Firstly, since in the blend force night process we extract energy from the ergosphere, where the matter is created by the electron-positron pairs, uh, uh, we should naively expect electron-positron jets. Well, in this case, when we extract energy from the accretion disk, uh, uh, we expect just electron proton jets. Second, we can see, so we have the situation of the uh, uh, rotating uh, disk and the polar magnetic field. The matter is uh, uh, extracted from the disk surface, accelerated along the magnetic field lines, and can be accelerated like this only up to alpha surface. Uh, and this alpha surface is when the uh, outward velocity equals the colloidal velocity, alpha velocities. We see, and that, that's discussed uh, by uh, Spruit in, in a few review papers. Above this, the force, uh, the uh, force-free approximation, even if it's true for the disk corona, let's say, um, breaks down, and it's because the inertia of matter, simply because when we reach the alpha velocity is equal to the uh, um, alternate velocity, we see that the 
inertia of the matter start to play a role, and the, uh, the matter cannot be accelerated anymore just along the rotating uh, uh, magnetic field lines. And because of this uh, vibration of the matter, magnetic fields start to be twisted. So very soon we start, we expect the um, a toroidal configuration of the magnetic field, starting from the pure colloidal. And that's interesting because the very nature of the toroidal magnetic field, also with the toroidal magnetic field, is to collimate the jet. So this, of course, uh, carries a current, right? And because just a uh, uh, J cross B force, we see that we have uh, uh, this, this kind of outflow should be self-collimated because there is a, a tension of the magnetic field lines, so the plasma is forced to be collimated. And on the same time, because of this tension is at the expanse of the pointing flux, we have a magnetic field gradient, uh, pressure gradient uh, along the jet, so this gradient accelerates the jets. So in this case, very quickly, so starting from a thinning surface, which we don't know exactly, but we estimate in case of AGN roughly of the order of 10 Schwarzy radii, we expect a toroidal magnetic field, uh, slowly collimating outflow, and slowly accelerating outflow. <coughs> and that's because acceleration and collimation is due to check cross B forces. And um, yeah, I have to read. So this is, uh, let's say, a summary of the previous study about the jet launching. And the second talk was uh, supposed to be about the observational constraints on the uh, on uh, the jets from the smaller up to larger scales, addressing in particular one issue. So, from what we know from the jet production models, is that we expect the jets to be dominated by the pointing flux, so uh, dominated by the magnetic field. Uh, we don't know if they should be electron positron, electron proton. Uh, both blend for Zion and blend for processes are studied under some approximations and are um, uh, examined by the numerical simulations which have also limitations. So it's not that we have a robust uh, expectation, let's say the, um, we can easily uh, falsify those models, but we can, let's say, try to discuss if the magnetic field is, dominate, uh, is, uh, is, dominant, um, uh, is dominating over the nature of the plasma at larger scales or not. And um, so this is the second part of the talk. So the, um, the most inner region of the jet that we can observe by means of uh, um, electromagnetic emission is so-called um, laser emission zone. We don't know exactly where the laser emission zone is located, except that because of the short variability and many other constraints, we know it has to be close to the nucleus. And um, also because of, um, so this is a typical spectrum of powerful blazer. Blazer is, um, so um, this is the, in some AGNs, some jet of AGNs display this uh, uh, very uh, strong non-thermal emission to peaks. And this is a synchrotron emission, as we know from the polarization. And this is most likely, almost undoubtedly, uh, inverse Compton emission. And um, due to several constraints like you know, variability, uh, opacity for the gamma rays, etc., we know that the, zone, uh, the emission zone has to be moving relati uh, relativistically, with Lorentz factor estimated of this order, it has to be small of this order. So this is the size of the emission region, but not the distance from the, from the center. Uh, and uh, so the question is where it is and uh, what kind of constraints for the jet parameters modeling of this emission gives us. Uh, the standard model for explanation is, as I said, we have a synchrotron emission some, due to some power low type population of ultra artistic electrons. And those electrons are scattered also all the photon fields are close to the nucleus. And we are, if we are really close to the nucleus, there are plenty of photon fields provided by the accretion disk. Um, the dusty torus, larger scales, the broad line region, so the matter reprocessing the disk emission, and we upscatter all of this, forming the inverse quantum bound. And uh, when we do this uh, uh, modeling in, in the framework of this uh, uh, electronic uh, scenario for the blazer emission, we get typically those parameters, as I said, and we also get the constraint that the magnetic field in the emission zone is less than the energy density in ultra artistic electrons. Roughly speaking, the inverse quantum peaks are much larger, much more, uh, there is much more energy here than in synchrotron emission. So, it seems that wherever the laser emission zone is, and this is for all the instruments, this emission is unresolved from the core. So we, uh, we, we cannot resolve it spatially by any instrument. Um, so the, uh, it seems that at this case, magnetic field has to be already uh, uh, less than the uh, uh, energy density. If it's external quantum, it's not so clear that this is. 
Uh, yeah, well, it's not that easy, of course, but when you just do the very standard calculations with those parameters. I mean, for simple machine compute, I understand that uh, the peaks give you the, these two quantities. You yeah. be and you, and you can well, well, you know, for external content, the amount of uh, emission, for example, you observe road lines, right? You observe the disk, so you know how much it is. Then it is amplified in the jet rest frame, right? So the ratio of this and this is basically the ratio of the uh, energy density in, in magnetic field to the energy density of the external photon field in the jet rest frame. So yeah, it's gamma it's square. Okay. Yeah. So you, you take, of course, into account this gamma square. Um, so, that, uh, not only the, the, the modeling of the spectral shape, but also some other considerations points out to the matter dominated jet uh, already in this case. So, for example, uh, this is work by Chilotin and Giselini, who compared the, for different classes of lasers, the, um, this is the, let's say, uh, kinetic luminosity carried by ultra atomistic electrons, uh, responsible for the broadband emission. Uh, this is the implied, uh, um, Pointing flux, and this is the total emitted energy. So the uh, so the interesting uh, uh, luminosity multiplied by gamma squared. So it's like um, uh, 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 integrated over all these solid angles, and we see that in most of the cases the total radiated energy exceeds what is carried by the uh, ultraviolet electrons or magnetic field. So those authors concluded that we have to add protons, and let's say for one electron positron pair, we have to add one proton and then we have enough power to explain it. Other way would be to not to invoke pro uh, protons, called protons, but called electrons that we don't see. And the problem with called protons is that we have a disk emission, and called protons in relativistic jets should bulk control scatter the disk emission in UV to soft X-rays, as discussed by uh, uh, many papers by my and collaborators. And we should, excuse, excuse me, called electrons. Called electrons. Yes, you have a code electrons in the protons. Oh, yes, 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 of course, yes, sorry. Uh, we should observe something like an excess at soft X-rays. This excess was not observed, so we can put constraints on the amount of the cold electrons. And this, this is this cold electrons, this is the power coming out of these calculations. We see this is not enough. So this is the, um, for, for a number of sources, the argument that protons, cold protons, carry part of the energy. And um, so what scale? So the, and this is, for example, a particular case of one uh, uh, blazer that we model and having a very nice X-ray observation, some X-ray uh, observations. As you see, the energy magnetic field is relatively uh, low. Interestingly, this is the required spectrum of the electrons. Uh, very flat, much flatter than the shock spectrum, um, below Lorentz factor 10, so it would be 100 MeV, and very, very steep above. So, um, so in other words, the blazer modeling indicates matter-dominated jet. But what scales uh, with the blazer emissions of probes? And this is not known, as I said. And um, if we believe in so-called internal shock models, when we say that the blazer emissions only is produced when some disturbances produced by the central engine collide, this is the typical scale when they collide, and that should be the scale of the blazer emission zone. Then there is a reconfinement shock model that the blazer emission zone uh, um, uh, marks the position of the um, converging uh, shock in a slowly collimated, just slowly collimating due to external pressure. This is at larger distances. But anyway, this is, these are the constraints. One have to, this kind of spectrum is also consistent with the shock mm -hmm. acceleration, as I will, be, uh, as I will uh, explain later. However, it's inconsistent with the standard diffuse shock acceleration. People claim that shocks uh, gives uh, ultra relativistic shocks, uh, shocks gives a spectrum e to minus two. We never basically you just observe this kind of spectrum. So um, moving further out, um, blazer is uh, emission zone is always unresolved from the nucleus. When we move further out and let's say parsec 100 parsec case, we can already resolve the jets by radio in radio in a VL, for example VLDR, and we can uh, observe. Uh, changes in the structure of the jet, in the emission, etc., etc. What we typically see, and there was a number of, of earlier people uh, doing this kind of researches, uh, is that on this small scale, let's say up to one to parsec, we very often observe uh, helical motions of the blobs. So the typical structure of the jet on, on this case, what we see, are uh, bright blobs. 
eventually embedded in some, um, um, let's say, radial channel. And this blob moves along the jet with super apparent superluminal velocities. So because of this apparent superluminal velocities, we know that they are relativistic, roughly with Lorentz factor 10 to 30 as estimated for the blazer emission zone. But we also see that, this, uh, um, that the tra trajectories of these blobs are helical. So some authors interpreted that this is because of the large-scale helical magnetic fields, and blobs just follow the large-scale helical magnetic field. That would point out to the domination of the <coughs> helical magnetic field on the very large scales. However, it was also pointed out that kelvin hempel's instabilities may result in a similar helical, let's say, like pattern. The other constraint, the other observational evidences. Um, there are a number of authors claiming that not only we see a helical trajectory of this block, but also slow acceleration of these blobs. In most of the cases, however, what we observe is that blobs placed closer to the nucleus have a slower, a lot lower apparent velocities that place further out. So it's not that we observe one blob freely accelerating. Nevertheless, uh, in some cases, they claim even seeing one blob accelerating, let's say, uh, from, let's say, Lorentz factor 2 up to 16 on the results case of 100 parsec. This kind of uh, slow acceleration is consistent with the models of, would be consistent with the model if we have a jet uh, produced due to platform planning process, very slowly correlated and very slowly accelerated uh, up to um, um, relativistic velocity due to the pressure of the magnetic field. So the pointing flux dominated jet uh, slowly converts pointing flux to the kinetic flux of the plasma and we have acceleration. However, this is a very, very large case, as I said, and the models for the electro fine process expect this acceleration to be completed at much larger, like a much smaller, like 10 to 3 scorching layer. So this is very controversial evidence. And finally, slowly collimating jets. I also mentioned that in the electro fine process, we expect a very, very slow collimation of the jet. And this is, in fact, observed. So this is the, um, the picture of M87 jet uh, very nearby radio galaxy on different scales. This is 100, this is 2 kiloparsecs, and then we zoom out. This is the scale of like uh, uh, 100 parsecs. And in, in this region, when we, uh, when we do the careful observations, this is the jet opening angle. You see that at the very beginning, the jet opening angle is very large, between 30 and 60 degrees. And then it slowly, slowly collimates. Up to the point when uh, there is the uh, terminal um, uh, uh, opening angle marking probably something like a shock, and most likely this shock is this shock that uh, this feature that we observe here. However, this kind of, and so that will be again consistent with the matter pointing dominated outflow as modeled by number of authors. However, it was also pointed out that this kind of slow collimation is consistent with the scenario of the reconfinement shock when we have overpressure jets being matter dominated jet being slowly uh, collimated due to the pressure of the amine medium. And when we just take the pressure of the amine medium from the X-ray observation uh, in M87 radio galaxy, uh, the, the, uh, this kind of collimation and the position of this confinement nozzle are also consistent with the matter dominated jet. So then once again, the uh, not very conclusive. Uh, one thing to mention is also that previously I, I said uh, about the blazer emission zone when for Gamma ray, uh, so we, uh, gamma ray, uh, we, from the blazers, we, uh, blazers are known for the gamma ray emission. In fact, the blazer luminosity exceeds the luminosity at the uh, lower frequencies, is produced very close to the center. Some people even say that very uh, in the vicinity of the supermassive black hole. It is interesting to note that this ray, the galaxy M87, has been detected in MA, uh, by the HES collaboration at TV energies. And this is the large scale of this, of this radio galaxy, 20 kiloparsecs and 2 kiloparsecs. Uh, and we zoom out to this, you know, inner regions like hundreds of Schwarzschild radii. This is the HES detection. Uh, and of course, because of the poor angular resolution of the TV instruments, we cannot resolve the emission size. We say that it's consistent with everything within like 2 kiloparsecs from the nucleus. What is interesting, however, is that this, uh, HST-1 not we monitored this HST-1, uh, uh, the whole radio galaxy in X-ray by Chandra, Radio, Hubble, and this is in um, 2005, the HST-1 not 
place 100 parsec away from the nucleus, uh, um, the maximum of the X-ray, synchrotron and radio emission. So, so it was getting brighter and brighter, 2005. Uh, this point was much brighter than the nucleus. And this is the, let's say, TV light curve of this jet. So we have nice coincidence, similar luminosities. Interestingly, at the peak of this, uh, um, the HST1 node started to emit superluminal blobs. So typically what we said is uh, that if there is a jet, black hole, and there are some blobs moving out of the black hole. However, this is in the object place far away, when we cannot really, what we see is large scales. This is so close that we can resolve this case, and what we see is that the nuclear portion of the jet, there is nothing. There are no blobs, they're just slowly collimating featureless outflow. However, the blobs, superluminal blobs, are produced by the stationary feature placed 100 parsecs away. And we propose that the TV emission is in fact originating also in this way, so very, very far away from the nucleus. There are, of course, the problem is that TV emission here at the point is variable on the time scale of days. That implies very, very compact size of the emission region, which is kind of hard to, uh, uh, there is nobody expected to have a, such a compact blob so far from the nucleus. On the other hand, this stationary feature between superluminal blobs is unresolved, so you can only put it up in lower limits. But they saw similar flares two years later with magic also, 2007 or 2008. Uh, no, they are not similar. They are, the magic flare is uh, much lower uh, luminosity, total luminosity. It's fact that, uh, so that was later because this is of uh, continue to, we, uh, of course, uh, with Chandra, we monitor it uh, up till now, and all the TV, uh, the TV Experiments are also looking for a make sense from time to time. So the uh, um, the AST1 was getting um, fainter and fainter till 2008, 2009. The nucleus, of course, during this time was always at the very, very low level. Nothing happens with the nucleus. And um, in 2000, uh, I think it was late 2008, something like this, when the AST1 was relatively uh, faint, still comparable to the nucleus, Magic reported uh, one day flare from M87. Uh, other constraints, and I'm really uh, uh, is the we can get some constraints on the structure and topology of the magnetic field from the polarization uh, measurements. And um, uh, the interpretation of the polarization data is very difficult, especially in the case of the relativistic jets, because of all the relativistic effects involved. And um, very roughly speaking, uh, when we observe a magnetic field, perpendicular to the jet axis, we can either say that that results from the, uh, because of, uh, that this is due to the toroidal magnetic field, aspect of the magnetic field, and, uh, but we can also say that this is due to shock compression. If we have tangled magnetic field and shocks within the outflow, then uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the shocks will compress the tangled magnetic field, giving rise to this kind of polarization. On the other hand, when we observe the uh, uh, magnetic parallel to the jet axis, we expect it due to the shearing effect. If there is a velocity shear, the, the magnetic field loops will be sheared, uh, giving uh, rise to the, this kind of polarization. And on the parsec case, so for this resolved jets, this is a typical pattern of set. Namely, within the jet span, we have a magnetic field um, uh, perpendicular to the jet axis, but within the spine, we have a parallel magnetic field. Then again, does it mean that the magnetic field is toroidal on this case, or let's say even helical as uh, advocated by uh, Gauza and collaborators? So within the jet spine, we see this configuration, and because depending on the, how helix looks like, at the edges we will have this configuration. Or we have just matter-dominated jet, jet and shocks here and velocity here, here. So what time number is it? How much so polarization do we It's typically on the level, I think, of like 20%. Uh, and interesting um, the thing is that in case of the large scale uh, toroidal magnetic field, we expect, and that was proposed in 1993, the rotation measured, measured gradients across the jet. At that time, that was just a pure speculation because nobody expected that we can resolve, not only resolve the jet uh, at small scales, uh, but also measure polarizations of the signal on the level of you know 10 percent, let's say, and measure a small rotation measure gradient across the jet. However, if you would have this kind of configuration, you see that uh, since the uh, rotation measure depends on the 
an integral of the magnetic field parallel to the line of sight, here it would have a different sign than here. So we should observe zero engine change of the magnetic line of the rotation uh, uh, measure. And the first observation of this kind was reported by Asada 2002, and there was a lot of criticism. People didn't believe in this very much. But then it occurred that actually these authors were correct. And right now we observe the Faraday rotation measure gradients across many, many jets. So uh, most of the work is done by Dennis Gabuz and collaborators. And we see, like, we observe the structure of the magnetic field and rotation measure gradient. I don't know if these pictures are very convincing, but they are much more much better, uh, uh, much more convincing, let's say, pictures. And so, for example, many people take it as a strong indication for the helical magnetic field on this case, as I said, 10 to 6 Schwarzschild radius, really, so pointing the magnetic jets. However, there are many, uh, if this interpretation is also not that uh, um, robust, and that's because we observe um, lambda, most importantly, lambda square dependence. So, that dependence for the rotation measure holds when the Faraday screen that is responsible for Faraday rotation is uh, external to the emission side. So we have a radio emission produced polarized radio emission within the jet, and then Faraday rotation produced by some external screen. So we know it has to be external to the emission side, but we don't know. It's like top, uh, it could not be also, for example, ambient medium because we see a, a relatively short variability of this rotation measure gradient that would be inconsistent with the, uh, for example, narrow light region or something like this. So maybe it's a sign of the spine sheet structure. As I said, from the simulation, we have some indication for this structure to be the case. And um, yes, moving to the largest case. So th that's for the, let's say, parsec scales, hundreds of parsec scales. Many indications for the, um, the uh, dominant toroidal magnetic field. However, uh, the interpretation is never robust. Uh, on the other hand, uh, blazer modeling indicates uh, matter-dominated jets, so either all the blazer modeling is not worth anything and, and we should change all the models of the blazer emission, uh, or this indication for the accelerating blocks and, and uh, rotation me measure gradients are incorrect. So what do we expect on large scales? Uh, so firstly, if we have a frozen in magnetic field, we expect uh, the uh, dominance of the toroidal magnetic field. And um, that can be, and roughly this kind of scaling would be consistent if we start close to the black hole, which is magnetic field estimated as 10 to 4 Gauss for a source addicti uh, attributing at the Eddington rate, roughly to have it on large scales. And this is, in fact, what seems to be the case. Uh, of course, this configuration are the, the, uh, for the polarization, we expect that if the matter is the um, dynamically dominant. Uh, there is a shear, so we start from some loops of the magnetic field. We have a velocity shear across the jet because of the interaction of the jet with the surrounding medium. So we have a shear of this loop, so net we will have something like a um, magnetic field configuration parallel to the magnetic field lines, uh, to the jet axis, and this is in fact what is observed. So, very roughly. And um, this is example of large scale jet, again, in 87. It's, uh, we can, this is kiloparsec space, we can, this is X-ray, optical, and radio. We can compare radio and optical polarization, structure, spectra, and everything. And we see this kind of, uh, again, the same uh, kind of configuration within the jet spine. Uh, uh, slight difference between radio and optical polarization, but within the broad side knots, which people think that, that these are shocks, parallel magnetic field, and at the edges, the, the perpendicular magnetic field. So, very consistent with the, um, matter dominated jet. Uh, what, is, uh, what was uh, discussed mostly before was how on large scales, how, uh, how the jets can be confined, so well confined on the scales of mega parsecs. So when we see the jets, these are extremely well collimated streams on large scales. So how they can be collimated? Why they don't, uh, you know, um, uh, why the jet angle is, uh, why they are almost cylindrical? And again, the, the people were discussing the magnetic point of examinated jet. Uh, mainly, again, the idea of the jet confined by the toroidal magnetic field, so current carrying jet. Uh, but uh, what is interesting to, to say in this respect is that uh, 
we expect slightly different morphology of large scale deaths in case of matter and uh, domination and uh, domination of the total magnetic field. Uh, so on large scale, so something that we can basically flow by the observation because those jets are resolved in radio and also in other words. And the difference is this is for example the simulations for a different strength of the magnetic field. This is strong magnetic field and this is no magnetic field. The difference is that when there is an outflow, which then converts the bulk kinetic energy to the internal energy at the terminal shock. And in case of the matter-dominated jet, this terminal shock marks the, the end of the structure, basically. So you have a jet, terminal shock, the bulk kinetic energy here is converted to the internal energy of the plasma, and the uh, end is, uh, because of the amine medium, is uh, uh, the, the, the matter is, um, uh, there is a backflow, let's say. It's the backflow in the jet frame, in fact, because this matter is not going toward the center again, but it's just stay here while the jet is propagated. So we say that this cocoons are formed because of the backflow. In case of the magnetic field, however, uh, the magnetic field, because of the toroidal structure, the backflow is suppressed. So the, the, magnetic, the, the particle cannot really cross that easily across the, the uh, uh, perpendicular to the, to the magnetic field lines. So here is this mark shot, let's say, but the outflow continues for this sort of kind of most uh, current morphology, and this is the, the uh, uh, more about this kind of morphology. So we have a mask disk here, and um, so this is the toroidal magnetic field. So there is a current, of course, and the current goes like this and then flows, let's say, along somewhere within the cocoon, and uh, and so we have a current. And because of the jet cross B4, so we see that this current collimates the jet first. It's hence the idea of the jet collimation, drives the expansion of the cocoon. Um, uh, uh, yes, and here the toroid is like slightly used toroidal magnetic field. And do we see the structures? No. So this is the typical kilo hundreds of kiloparsecs radio structure of radio galaxy. We see the, we see a jet, terminal shock, and then the back. So no sign of the nose, uh, nose cone morphology. Uh, there are some problematic examples, like for example, uh, jet in PC279, which has a very narrow cocoon, and no counter, nothing on the counter jet side, and um, claim to be consistent with the pointing dominated jet. But then again, if this jet does not propagate within the, extent, within the external medium, by, but within the uh, ready cocoon formed due to in the previous jet activity, um, it, uh, it is propagates in a ballistic way, so kind of differently than this jet. So this jet propagates within the dense environment of the cluster. This is signal Z. But if the medium was verified in a previous jet uh, uh, activity, uh, epoch, then those ballistic jets have this kind of uh, morphology. And this is, in fact, as observed in so-called double-double sources. So we have very faint cocoon and the new jets propagating not within the uh, amine medium, uh, intergalactic medium, but within this cocoon, so very low density plasma, and they look pretty much like this. Uh, again, uh, so then another piece of evidence to address this issue of like, magnetic dominated or pointy dominated is um, surprising discovery of a Chandra X observatory that the large-scale jets are a strong X-ray emitters, much stronger than expected. So uh, nobody expected jets on the scale of, this is mega scale, basically, will be a strong X-ray emitters detected uh, and resolved by Chandra. And, and right now there are many, many of cases that we do see it. This is the typical spectrum for this kind of jets, of this not in particular, radio optical and inverse quantum, uh, and something else. And uh, the standard interpretation involves inverse Compton emission. However, this is mega parsec scale. There are not that many fields that can be scattered effectively, um, except of CMB. But in order for this, uh, for this model to work, one has to involve uh, large bulk velocities on the mega parsec scale. And this kind of modeling gives us, just like in case of blazers, um, uh, constraint that the magnetic field is negligible, energy density is really at least roughly on the, with the equipartition with the ultra-artistic electrons, but most of the matter is, uh, energy is carried by the protons. There are some cavities, however, to this interpretation. Firstly, is that in this inverse compton scenario, 
because the CMB increases with redshift strongly. We expect going to high and high redshift to observe very, very bright uh, X-ray jet, brighter and brighter, basically. And we carried the program with the Chandra Observatory. I mean, so far, I think something like 12 uh, jets on this redshift, and this is uh, work in preparation. So as you see, it's amazing that the redshift 4, we, we can resolve the jet in X-rays. So this is really amazing. However, we see that the ratio of X-ray to radio power for this jet is the same as in the low ratio. So we don't see any uh, expected increase, suggesting that this model doesn't work. In this context, it, it is interesting to know that, again, 3C73 large scale jet, we see the same situation, one component and the other component and the X-rays. And when we look in ultraviolet, this ultraviolet connects with the X-rays. The point is, however, that this emission is polarized at the level of 20%. So it cannot be really easy in response to CMB because then we don't expect polarization. So it seems rather that this is like a two uh, different component of the synchrotron continuum, non-standard spectrum. If this is the case, and if the X-ray emission result from this jet, large the jet, is synchrotron and not inverse component, magnetic field can be uh, stronger than uh, uh, the expression value. And finally, I'm really just like two slides more. When we go even up to this terminal hotspots, we um, recently, uh, last week in the Nordica uh, program, we had a lot of discussions about the particle spectra form and the shocks and how the shock works, etc., etc. So, terminal hotspots in radio galaxies are the places of shocks. Unlike in the case of gamma reverse, we can resolve the shocks and different uh, result. I mean, from the nucleus and from the other classic <coughs> components. Of course, we don't see a structure that directly, but in X rays, in radio, and in other fields. And this is the standard picture, so we have a jet, again, uh, terminal shock, so something like the external shock in, uh, in gamma reverse, in intercluster medium, uh, forward shock, and the shock interstellar, uh, inter inter cluster medium, the reverse shock, shock jet medium, and here the, uh, and the, then the back flow. What is interesting to say that we never observe the emission from this region in the case of AGM, like there are absolutely no signs of anything here. What we do observe as a non thermal emission is the emission of the reverse shock. And um, the brightest hotspots are in, uh, in our radio galaxy signals A. This is X ray picture and uh, radio. We had a spacer observation. This is the complete uh, um, spectral energy distribution of these two hotspots, so two terminal shocks. And can be very well modeled by the Sihotron and Sihotron self Copton scenario. And what comes out from this uh, modeling is that uh, the, at, at the, in the, let's say, the terminal shock region, the energy of the magnetic field is in equipartition with the electrons. And this is the spectrum of the electrons. This is the energy spectrum of the electrons multiplied by um, energy squared, so this is like a power. What we see is that, of course, just like in the case of particle blazers, nothing like e to minus 2 standard shock let's say spectrum that would be flat in this range, but very flat here and very steep here. And interestingly, uh, uh, the, the peak is at the uh, energy corresponding to the one if the uh, uh, energy of the electrons is comparable to the rest energy of the top. Right? So for the Lorentz factor of the electrons, that would be the ratio of magnetic field to, to uh, electric field. And we argue that this cannot be due to the, let's say, this flatness here of the radio continuum cannot be due to the uh, absorption, like the hydrogen cell absorption, because we are expected to be at much lower frequencies. And also, if you make it e to minus two spectrum, we will overproduce this emission. And that this thickness cannot be due to the cooling effect. So it seems that this is the spectrum formed at widely relativistic shocks. And this is, in fact, expected from some theoretical investigations. But it also indicates that most of the energy is deposited at the energy of the proton. So this is strong, although indirect, argument for the dynamical role of protons at these terminal shocks. And the final slide, when we go to even largest case, so I was talking about the jets, and then when we look at those huge structures, mega parsec scale structures, so-called lobes, we observe radio emission from this, we detect X-ray emission. These lobes are non-relativistic, so there are no problems in modeling, let's say, in the sense that in case of plasma moving with relativistic by velocity, we always have some um, uh, relativistic effects uh, taken into account, but in this case, no. 
And this model is for not for one source, but for something like we collected for more than 60 sources, always indicate that the magnetic field is at the level of the equipartition level, so the magnetic field pressure is equal to the electron pressure within the lobes. So then the picture may, uh, emerges, let's say that whatever is in the jets, so um, they are um, contradicting uh, observational constraints on the dynamical role of the magnetic field <coughs> within the jets from the smallest case up to kiloparsec scales. But whatever the case is, with at the terminal shocks, uh, rough equipartition is reached, and then the whole structure evolves in an equipartition between magnetic field and particles. So as a conclusion, uh, what we know is that magnetic field seems to be crucial in launching of the jet and formation of the jet. So extracting energy from the disk or a rotating black hole, um, collimation and acceleration up to relativistic velocities, need magnetic field, there are no other competing models. However, when we look at all the observational constraints, they indicate either weak magnetic field or at least uh, equipartition between particles and magnetic field. Um, the structure of the jet magnetic field uh, is hardly known and uh, the particle spectra formed are never of, let's say, standard e to minus 2 form, but really significantly they are very steep or two components, pileups, etc., etc. But because we don't know that, well, the, the role of the structure of the magnetic field, also the particle acceleration and energy dissipation processes are uh, not well known. So. Uh, a lot of uh, things to be, uh, uh, plenty of things to be discussed in the future, let's say. Sorry for taking the Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Ms. Kim. Uh, I have uh, two questions, and uh, one of them is, uh, what's the difference? for your point of view between uh, point uh, length of pain and length of life. Uh -huh. And uh, what you can say about uh, works about the acceleration of the jets with uh, saturation and when you have a partition so on more effective ways. So, um, oh, so very roughly, um, the difference between the blend for pain and blend for night process, um, naive expectations, would be electron-positron jet versus electron-proton jet. These are naive in the sense that when we see in these um, simulations and from the theory that this um, jet extracted from the ergosphere of the black hole consists of electron-positron pairs. But then, but then, in a, let's say, more realistic simulation when we add something like external medium, we have also this, this corona and this is unknown, for example, if there is some uh, penetration of the um, of this, let's say, inner walls in the jet. If, for example, that uh, it seems unlikely because the steroidal magnetic field particles would have to uh, diffuse across the magnetic field lines. But it's not out of question to consider the possibility that you have an electron-positron jet at the very beginning only, but then there is some proton loading in the jet because of some instabilities. Uh, the other thing is configuration of the magnetic field, so the people doing this uh, 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 simulations of the blank cosmic process uh, playing the colloidal magnetic field up to 10 to 3 Schwarzschild radii, and uh, in blank for pine process we expect toroidal magnetic field from the very beginning. Still, those simulations probe very, very inner regions that are never uh, probed by observations. So, I think it's very hard to say what would be the difference between the like observational difference when we look from the jet, right? If we can say, oh, this is blend for snake jet or blend for pain jet. All the simulations, like for example, um, this structure of the magnetic field seems to depend what you assume for the uh, magnetic field, etc. What is the, uh, the, I think that the way of, of checking these things would be more energetic, energetical. So for example, if um, uh, the blend for snake jets, depends, the efficiency for this depends on the square of the, of the spin parameter square. So it's a strong function of the spin. So if we could, for example, say that indeed the powerful jets are launched by the rapidly spinning black hole, that would be a strong support for the blend for process, in my opinion. 
As for the, um, for the other question, yes, that in fact, um, in this, um, uh, it was about acceleration, right? So the change between the pointing flux and the kinetic. So, yeah, this, this, acce this uh, collimation acceleration is because of the uh, uh, conversion of the pointing flux to the kinetic flux. This is what you're asking? I ask, I say, what I know that it's two independent groups who make uh, calculations, uh, which get uh, transformation from pointing flux to kinetic one more than 50%. Yes. It's one, and uh, I can give you uh, three different theoretical uh, groups which get the same result. But now we have a full agreement between them. Yeah, but if I can... Maybe I should uh, go to the, uh, well, maybe not. Uh, so there are plenty of uh, groups talking about this. The question is up to how far this collimation and acceleration proceeds, right? Where the terminal velocity is reached. In a standard model, is, uh, uh, the terminal bulk velocity is the sigma parameter to the power one over three. There are some groups, like Baskin on the other hand, who say that it actually you can convert the total pointing yes. flux to the kinetic flux. And that is complicated because when you consider this blend for pine situation, you end up with the so axisymmetric ideal MHD, you end up with the Grazia Franov equation, which is very complicated to solve it, and it depends like what you assume at the beginning, what kind of configurations. So it's not easy, and what uh, one group proposed, and even if the other group uh, um, say, I don't think it's like the, the, the last word. There is also another factor that can complicate it, namely king instabilities. That was studied by, I think, Janis, right, and Spruit, that if the, this, the, uh, this time carrying hot flows are unstable due to king instabilities, if they play a role, king instabilities, they dissipate magnetic energy. Uh, 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 giving a rise to the faster collimation, even. So you have to take also this kind of things into account. If you make like just analytical studies solution of the Glatschakanov equation, you don't have key instabilities, right? If you want to address it by numerical simulations, you have to do it in 3D. Uh, but then it's impossible to run it at sufficiently you know, f uh, far away. If you do 2D, you don't have key instabilities, so you miss possibly the effect, right? So. Uh, there are theoretical indications that, in fact, the, uh, 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 that you can convert all pointing flux to kinetic flux. Some, but where? Somewhere around uh, uh, the fast magnetizing surface, let's say, is 100 Schwarzschild uh, radii. People claim 10 to 3, 10 to 4 Schwarzschild radii. Maybe this, is, this, this exactly marks the blazer emission zone. Well, as I said, these are some models uh, uh, basing on, uh, if, if simulation, for example, 2D, you have to ask how robust are predictions of 2D model. And this, uh, regarding this issue, so I, uh, this presentation. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can continue after the, okay. because uh, maybe there are some other questions. You can tell it before. So you think it's possible to have a pointing flux dominate Z, but still in the dissipation region, where Presumably, what you can expect is pointing flux. In this region, you are dominated by the energy density in the electrons, for example, because you just dissipate the magnetic field in the first place. Is yes. this another possibility? Or? Yeah, I even mentioned in one slide that uh, you know, to, to, to get rid of this energetic problem for blazers, what would be possible to say that to sum up, the jet is uh, dominated by the pointing flux, but the blazer emission zone is produced by the, within some subvolumes which is uh, locally uh, dominated by electric field, uh, by, uh, sorry, matter. And that's because, for example, if there is a reconnection, you basically annihilate magnetic field. So that's one possibility, which is just uh, what you assume, basically, right? Uh, what, what would be in support to this is the very, very short variability of TV detected from VLX that suggests that whatever you place the blazer emission zone, even if you place close to the, the, the black hole, is still smaller than the, the whole jet volume. So if there are indications, more like in M87, right? I said like, it seems that it's far away, but it's very compact. 
So you have a compact sum volume, and this is possible, of course. So th therefore, I said that laser modeling may, may be changed, right? Regarding this, just coming back to slides, so this is the, this flat for prime process, right, is uh, analyzed by a set of ideal um, axisymmetric equation, and it's very, uh, these are this number of papers, only some of them addressing this issue. So, you know, it's not that one paper, some one group said, and uh, it is problematic because the, mm, it's a, uh, uh, basically, because of the, uh, uh, you have a critical points that uh, you don't, um, whatever uh, the position of this, like, so alpha and magnesonic uh, uh, surfaces depends on the initial configuration, uh, what you assume, and then just about this acceleration. So this is, for example, the so role of key instabilities for reducing the flux. And, uh, okay, here, there is this slide. So, from the, uh, the first model, we expect that the terminal velocity one third of the, uh, of the sigma parameter uh, at fast magnet sign surface, so 100 Schwarz radii. And a, a number of authors argued and, and showed under some assumption that it is allowed to convert all the pointing flux to kinetic flux that would result like the signal parameter, the, the terminal Lorentz factor is this. But where exactly and under which conditions is, is a question uh, of the debate. Because for example, uh, in, in most of the models you have to add some external medium right, to coordinate the jet, like, like uh, pointing, uh, by, as did by uh, Google Valor and Singalos. So uh, it's not that you have a pointing dominated jet and then you can solve the equation because it also depends what kind of structure, like a pressure profile you assume for the amine medium. Okay, other questions? Uh, when you talk about electron energy density, if you think that electrons are cooling faster than your dynamical time scale, it means that actually the radiation energy density should be much higher than the electron energy density, right? Um, the total energy density, yeah. like in a standard picture that you have. Uh, um, yeah, I just uh, was wondering when you write, for example, your electron energy density is equal to the magnetic energy density. The electron energy density is, uh, I mean, is it interesting actually? Uh, no, I know because it, the electrons are cooling many times. So when most of the energy is not, not not by the cooled electrons. Okay. Yeah. So they're dominated by yes, slow cooling. Yes, most of the energy is like this electron's Lorentz factor 10 to 2, 10 to 3. This is not a, on large scales. Uh, it, it, of course, there was no time to discuss everything, right? For, so for example, for low power, just like the uh, I, I showed the spectrum for the um, powerful blazers, right? Mm -hmm. Consisting of this broken power law, just like a terminal shock. When we look at the spectra in B lab objects, so low power lasers, the spectra look completely different. They are uh, more um, uh, consistent with the ultra artistic max value. Right? So then you have to have some kind of, uh, that, that we discussed a lot uh, during last days, right? Uh, um, continuous acceleration uh, uh, acting together with the energy losses. Uh, in Powerful quasars like in these terminal shocks and, and this laser modeling, most of the energy is carried by the electrons that are in a slow cooling region. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there are no questions, then we'll finish. And thanks. Thank you.